So at this time, I'd like to thank our police credit union for sponsoring this lead series. For over 65 years, the police credit union has been providing financial solutions to take care of our own exclusively serving law enforcement professionals and their family members uh, throughout California. They proudly provide banking solutions, including checking accounts, home and auto loans, credit cards, auto, uh, online services, and much more. As your financial partner, Police Credit Union is committed to helping you succeed financially, whatever your stage of life. So we thank Police Credit Union for being our exclusive one source premier financial partner and for sponsoring our lead series. All right, my name is Sean Rundle. I'm the Deputy Director here at CPOA's office in Sacramento. Um, this CPOA lead series was created uh, immediately upon the onset of this pandemic so that the profession could stay connected and share best practices on a, a range of topics, uh, maintaining personnel motivation, response to all of the issues of late, um, civil unrest, day-to-day uh, -day operations, and so today's topic certainly plays into that. Uh, this mesh, this uh, session, again, is truly meant to be a roundtable, so we look forward to hearing your ideas, solutions, and questions uh, during this forum from our speakers. So the conversation this afternoon is drones and first responders, and we're grateful that Skyfire Consulting has taken time to share with us today and provide some takeaways uh, for your department. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to Ben Kroll with Skyfire to, to get us going, and uh, again, look for the the survey and poll questions to be coming up and, and feel free to engage uh, via the chat box and um, we'll facilitate that engagement. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Ben. Awesome. Thanks, Sean. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Ben Kroll and I am the COO and co-founder of Skyfire Consulting. So we're based in Atlanta, Georgia. We have an office in Denver and I'm actually in the Denver office right now. And uh, this is essentially what we do. We go around, we do training and consulting uh, for uh, FAA and, and agencies building drone programs and help with policy and development and all that kind of stuff. So uh, my background, just real quick, is as a, um, I'm a commercial pilot and flight instructor. I've got about 5,000 hours in a variety of aircraft. And uh, I've developed a lot of the training that we do at Skyfire and some of the um, uh, policy uh, and implementation that we do. I, I, I kind of run some of that stuff. So I am joined today uh, by my good friend, uh, Fritz. And um, if you guys don't know Fritz Reber, Fritz um, is retired from uh, Chula Vista. And I'll let him kind of introduce himself here in a minute. But um, uh, I'm always super excited whenever I get to talk to Fritz because Fritz was kind of um, at the forefront of developing some of the, like the really cool um, uh, the ability to do some of the stuff that we can do in law enforcement with drones today and kind of being out front with some of that. So that's some of the stuff that we're going to talk about today. Um, but I'll just kind of give Fritz here a minute just to kind of introduce himself and, and talk about his background. All right, thanks, Ben. It's always a pleasure to join you and talk about drone as first responder um, and appreciate it, Sean, for the invite. Uh, right now, I'm head of public safety integration at Skydio. Um, certainly very interesting job now that we released the X2, so I'm super excited to talk to agencies uh, every day about that, um, and it's obviously more designed for public safety. So, uh, so I do get a chance to talk a lot about drones. I retired from Chula Vista a couple of years ago, back in 2018. Um, before I left, uh, developed the Drone as First Responder program for them in partnership with uh, CAPE uh, and CAPE Termez, and of course, Ben, you and I, and he uh, worked on the Beyond Visual Line of Sight waiver that Chula Vista is now enjoying. And, uh, and then uh, obviously some uh, news about a new waiver that they've obtained that we can talk about later. So uh, yeah, just just enjoying the retirement. I did I, busier than I thought I might be, but uh, the drone world is super interesting and I'm glad to be here. Awesome. Well, yeah, we're glad to have you. Um, thanks again to CPOA for having us and, and to be here to talk about this. One of the things, you know, Fritz and I were talking about the other day was that when we have, even when you have 30 minutes, 60 minutes, um, there's so much stuff that you can talk about. There's a lot in here. So uh, one of the things that we wanted to do real quick was just kind of get an idea of uh, kind of where people are at. If people have programs, if people are just kind of, uh, you know, putting their toe in the water, figuring out kind of what they need to do next. Um, so, uh, Sean, if you wouldn't mind putting up uh, maybe that first survey question, if 
everyone wouldn't, wouldn't mind just kind of weighing in on this first. We've got four questions here that I want, want to run through real quick. And it looks like we can, we can uh, launch all those questions together. So we'll give everyone ample time. Uh, oh, perfect. Okay. That'll hopefully help you. You can see kind of everything at once. So hopefully this. Perfect. This, uh, so we'll, uh, you should see the questions up there. And again, um, be sure to scroll down to the bottom and we'll, we'll give everyone uh, a few minutes to, to respond to these. And, and just so everyone knows, th this is actually, um, this isn't just something that we store and are like, oh, that's interesting. This is actually really helpful for us to be able to um, respond to your needs and some of the problems that you're having out there. That, that's kind of, um, we're, we're really in a research and development uh, phase still in this industry. There's a lot of people that say that there are experts out there. I'm not convinced that we really have any uh, real experts yet. I mean, we have a lot of people with a lot of uh, knowledge and experience, but um, but we're still figuring this thing out. And so that's kind of where we, we need your guys' help. Uh, and that's where these questions come in. And uh, we want to know kind of where, where you guys are having trouble and, and where, um, you know, where the, some of the pain points are. So we're almost to 50% responding. So we'll give it another maybe 20 seconds or so. And okay, cool. All right, so here are the results from. Cool, awesome. And is this, Sean, is this sharing with everyone? It's, yes, it is. The, the poll results, okay, cool. Um, okay, so it looks like uh, almost half of you. Wow, yeah, so, uh, okay, cool. So it looks like there, it's interesting seeing these numbers change. It looks like, uh, I think over half have, have some type, well over half have some type of uh, drone program established, okay. Uh, that's good to know. Um, Looks like, uh, wow, 57% of those programs are operating under uh, both CO and 107. That's good to know. Um, uh, number three, how would you describe its effectiveness? That's interesting. You know, we have 30% that's not effective at all. And that's that's the stuff that we want to know about. Like, we want to try and figure out, like, why why is that not effective? So uh, if anyone, uh, maybe offline, I'm going to share my contact info here uh, in a little bit. And if anyone offline can fill me in on that, uh, why your drone program is not effective, that, that's actually super helpful information for me um, so that we can uh, try and create a solution there. And then uh, what's been the most challenging obstacle? Um, boy, yeah, that, that says it all. 71% uh, say difficulty in understanding compli uh, compliance with regulations. So uh, super interesting stuff. Uh, thanks, Sean, for that. And uh, thanks, everybody, for, for, I mean, it's just super helpful data there. So what we're going to talk about today is um, I'm gonna do kind of a quick uh, intro into um, uh, kind of what it takes to build a program. Um, we're not gonna spend a whole lot of time on it, but just kind of some, some quick and dirty uh, stuff on that. We'll talk about regulations a little bit too, because I know that even those of you who have a COA and are operating under part 107, all that stuff, still run into questions with that too. So, um, and then once we're gone, we, you know, we like to share. Um, once, you know, once this, this webinar is over, um, I'm an open book, feel free to call me, email me, uh, text me. I'd like to um, be able to provide you guys with the information and the correct information. So uh, so we're just gonna dump, jump right into this real quick here. And like I said, I'm gonna start with um, kind of the, the four components to um, what, what I would call building a successful UAS program. And let me just try and share my screen here real quick. Getting better at this uh, Zoom thing, here we go. Okay, so like I said, I'm not going to run through all these slides here. This is just kind of some some reference for everyone. Uh, let me can let's see. So I'm not sharing. Sean, am I sharing there? Let's see. Okay. okay, thanks. Uh, let me move this stuff over here. Is that? Uh, let's see. All right. Hey, Sean, is that still sharing there? Yes, I see it. 
Oh, that's weird. It's telling me right now it's not sharing. So sorry about that, guys. <laughs> Some technical difficulties here. Um, but really the four key, key components that we want to talk about. So that's your equipment, right? That's the kind of drones or the, the unmanned aerial systems that you're going to get. A lot of options out there. Everybody's heard of DJI, I'm sure. They're, they're kind of the big name out there. Um, but, uh, but we've got some more uh, innovation happening and especially some more uh, innovation happening uh, within the US and, and with what Fritz is doing over at Skydio and some of the technology they've developed. So uh, if you haven't checked that out, make sure you, you get into that. Um, there's some, some pretty neat stuff happening there. Um, the second one's FAA regulations and certification. Obviously, like we, you know, we were looking at, that's, that's a tough one for, for most folks. And uh, training is another one, you know, how do you get trained up and where do you go for training? And can you do that internally? Can you create your own uh, training program? Those kinds of things. Hey, ben. And then obviously, yeah. You know, your screen is not sharing. And, and I, I went through this oh, the other not. day. When you, if you, when, you okay. when you change screens, you have to reshare it, I think is what you have to do. So I tried that, and what's happening is when I'm hitting play on my keynote here, it's for some reason it's stopping the share. I'm not sure why. So I just if, won't hit play. If, if you click on the stop, uh, it turns yellow up at the top of the screen, correct? R correct, yeah. If you click on that, I think it gives you an option to reshare. So click the play and then go up to that yellow bar and, and click on it. Does it do anything? Uh, let me find my cursor here. Yeah, it just doesn't get rid of that yellow bar. I think this may be some type of technical issue here. Okay. Yeah, because I'm trying that. And it says it turns yellow. It says sharing is paused. Resume share. And I click that and it just doesn't do anything. So. Okay. Um, but you guys are, you can see this screen, right? Everything went away now. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's try this again. How about that one? Can you see that one? Yeah, we can see yeah. that. Okay. That one. Okay, cool. Uh, awesome, thank you. And uh, so we talked a little bit about equipment. Uh, let's talk about regulations just for a moment. And I know I saw a handful of folks uh, are operating under part 107, some are operating under COA, a lot are operating under both. Uh, if you don't know those terms that I just threw out there, uh, I'll give you just kind of a, a quick walkthrough. Um, and then I always put this on here to say, don't be afraid. Uh, the FA is here to help and wants your program to be successful. And that's true, uh, that, that's been my experience. Um, you know, the FAA sometimes gets a bad rap for uh, some of the stuff that they do and, and some stuff rightfully so. But with this and with them uh, trying to integrate this into public safety, uh, we have found that they uh, want these programs to be successful. And uh, sometimes it's hard to find the right information, even going from one FAA person to the other. So if you run into that, please call me. Um, we've, we've done a lot of work to, to make sure that we're giving out the right information there. So, uh, so... Uh, we talk about uh, two different ways, really, that you can operate um, uh, drones for an agency. You cannot operate your drone uh, for your agency as a hobbyist. It's not something you can do. You can only do that. Uh, that would be somebody going to Best Buy and buying a drone and putting it up and um, uh, flying it around for their own enjoyment. If you want to fly for your agency or uh, operate commercially, you either need to have a Part 107 certificate. So that's an FAA certificate. So once you get this certificate, you're actually a certificated pilot, according to the FAA, uh, under Part 107. So, uh, and that's, that's considered civil aircraft operations. And so you can actually use that. It's much like if you were driving a police car for your agency uh, or police vehicle, uh, you, ha you use your driver's license that you got from the DMV as your uh, certificate to operate that vehicle. Same thing with this. You're using your 107 certificate to operate for the agency. So. Uh, the other way you can fly is as a public aircraft operator. And so that's a government agency. Uh, you have to be able to prove to the FAA that you're a government agency. And those are statutes that actually came from Congress uh, many years ago. And uh, they kind of said, what Congress said was, if you want to fly as a public aircraft operator, you can, um, your, your mission has to meet a, uh, what they call a governmental function. And so a government is an activity undertaken by a government for these uh, seven things, national defense, intelligence gathering, firefighting, search and rescue, law enforcement, aeronautical research, biological, geological resource management. What this means in a practical sense is that if you're an agency and you're operating under a COA, which means you're operating under public aircraft operations, 
uh, you uh, can only do these things per, for your missions. If you wanted to get video of, say, a parade in your community and then post that on Facebook, technically you cannot do that with a COA. Technically, you have to have a 107 operator who is doing that mission. So some nuance and detail there. I, I always like to kind of remind people of that, even those who have kind of programs who've been stood up for a few years. That's an easy one to forget um, and, and gets you can get you afoul of uh, some FAA rules there. So I always like to remind folks of that. So those are the two ways you can operate uh, legally as an agency. Um, training uh, is pretty straightforward. A lot of training providers out there and, um, you know, a lot of a lot of good ones, a lot of not so good ones. If anyone needs recommendations on training providers, happy to provide that. I'm sure Fritz can too. And uh, then we talk, talk about uh, like uh, policy and, and uh, challenges and implementing and all that. Um, really what we're talking about is um, uh, like opposition that you might run into and things that you want to think about beforehand, like community engagement. And that's one I think Fritz can talk about here in just a minute. Uh, but all the things that kind of come along with this, like you have to build uh, a policy for it, right? You have to build um, operations for it and best practices and those kinds of things. So that's sort of the fourth component in there. So uh, th that's kind of what it takes, really. Obviously, within that stuff, there's a lot, especially within the regulations. I did kind of a, just a quick cursory uh, discussion of that. So um, I'm just going to kind of pause there for a second and see, does anyone have any questions on any of that stuff that I covered so far? Or Sean, has anyone uh, commented on any question or put up any questions? Not yet, but again, uh, feel free to use the chat box or unmute yourself and, and uh, speak up if you have a question or, or, or a comment. Cool. All right. Well, if uh, if we don't, then so I just told you from my perspective, uh, you know, kind of what it takes, what I've seen successful agencies do to build programs. Uh, like I said, we're fortunate enough to have Fritz Reber here, and uh, I'm going to kind of turn it over to him and ask him to talk about uh, what that process was like, actually kind of taking all that stuff, starting from scratch, and kind of where that came from, and um, and and what they did down at uh, Chula Vista. So, uh, Fritz, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Ben. Um, yeah, to be to be honest, uh, the the person who started the team was Captain Bernsley, and he's running the team now since I've left. Um, and he in, did a crawl, walk, run strategy, which uh, the FA recommends, and that's build trust within the community um, before you buy your first drone. And a lot of times people buy a drone and then form the team around it. Um, that's a natural progression, but I think it's, it makes more sense to sort of uh, build a team and then decide what kind of operations you wanna do and then determine what kind of hardware you want. Um, Coincidentally, drone responders released a few days ago something developed in coordination with Skydio and Brendan Grove, the head of policy and regulation, called the, the five C's, which are sort of the building blocks of uh, building a drone program that's built on a foundation of trust. Uh, the five C's being community engagement, civil liberties and privacy, common operating procedures, uh, clear oversight, and then cybersecurity. Um, those didn't exist when Vern started the team. Um, he just some nuts and bolts of what he did. He formed a committee, got a bunch of stakeholders inside the police department, inside the fire department in the city. Uh, they got together, got a draft of a policy. They invited the ACLU to, to provide input, um, got community leaders that might not have agreed to see what their concerns were, tried to address all those in a policy. Then they put the policy up for public comment. They set up an email and asked for everybody to uh, anybody in the community to email questions or concerns. The fact that there is a lack of concern was also a, a great tool to bring to the, the city leaders that there wasn't a big opposition within the community and there was some excitement actually. Um, so uh, it sort of was a process that everyone could weigh in on and, and was full transparency. And so that's what got the foundation going. I took over the team after that and then in, had the opportunity to do the drone as first responder uh, concept of operations through the IPP, which was really an advanced use of drones that no one had been doing at all. And just the idea that we were gonna be sending out drones out over the community to radio calls all day, every day, um, was not met with the opposition we thought because of that groundwork. And some of the strategies that we uh, learned from, we 
made sure we continued with the drone as first responder. If you go to the Chula Vista Police Department website, uh, you know, it's very well articulated what drone as first responder is. It, it shares the policy. It shares some video of best case scenarios. Um, they have flight data that's posted up there real time each and every day. Um, they share the flight path, uh, partnered with a company called 911 Security to get the flight path of each drone flight so that people uh, who were concerned about drones over the city could say, was that a police drone? Was that somebody else's? They could go on there and see. Uh, so those type of transparency things continued the trust that the community has. And so there wasn't a lot of pushback and there still isn't. And they're flying today as we speak, uh, oh, responding to radio calls, getting ahead of ground units, um, and providing intel to officers and firefighters before they even arrive at scene. And so that's kind of the progression that it's taken. And I think even without advanced uh, use cases and beyond visual line of sight, if you just, just standard uh, traditional drone use, which is, you know, you basically go to the scene, assess the need for an air support, throw up a drone, to do that and not get a lot of pushback from the community and get them to understand the value and that you're going to use it responsibly and and transparently, it requires going through a lot of the steps that you've been talking about and that uh, Chula Vista did and a lot of agencies out there. And so uh, that's what I talk to agencies about on a daily basis. And I think Ben and you and Matt and others have been talking about in terms of what to do before you start training and buying equipment. Yeah, absolutely. I think that because you're right, we, we've seen a lot of people kind of go out and get like, oh, cool, like we'll go get the drone and then like figure out how we're going to use it. I think it's important to ask like, what are our missions, right? Like, where do we envision that? And sure, that changes some, but uh, I think that's probably one of the most important questions to ask first, right? Like, what are we doing with this? Like, where, you know, what, what problems are we solving, you know, within the community? And then the other thing that uh, I thought that uh, Chula Vista did really well is, is that community engagement. Right. I mean, I remember going to I went to a few uh, media events, you know, where there was like local, I even think some national media out there and just um, telling everybody what's going on and being very transparent. And then if we look at um, this is what uh, I think you mentioned this, Fritz, the uh, the website here, the portal. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Or um, so this is and this is another piece of it, too, of that transparency is that. Uh, you know, Chula Vista has this dedicated uh, drone program page that the. Um, the uh, community can come and, and see what's going on with it. And then it's got even this dashboard here, which we'll talk about here in just a second. But Fritz, would you mind just kind of, um, well, and, and before I have you do this, I'll just explain real quick. Uh, Fritz mentioned that uh, Chula Vista has the ability to fly beyond visual line of sight right now, or what we call BB loss. And that's sort of been like a holy grail for us in the drone industry with trying to uh, do more, right? Because when, when we're limited to line of sight, right? You picture uh, maybe an officer showing up on scene then determining, okay, I need to use the drone now. And, and Fritz, you said this a few years ago and I'll never forget it. What we're doing is we're changing the drone from becoming a reactive tool to a proactive tool, right? So instead of, um, you know, if you can go beyond visual line of sight, then the officer responding doesn't even have to deal with the drone technology. In fact, the officer responding can have their tablet out and they're actually seeing live what the drone is seeing because the drone was allowed to fly beyond visual line of sight. And so uh, that's what Fritz was talking about, the, um, that authorization that we got from the FAA, which was uh, a whole lot, a fair amount of work. Um, but, uh, but that's what we're trying to do. We're saying if we can get some of these regulations, you know, push some of this stuff, uh, then we can actually do more with the technology and we can do more uh, and give our responding officers more data and better data. Uh, because that's really what they need showing up on scene, right? Being able to determine, you know, you get a call for a gun, you don't know, right? If we can determine that, you know, ahead of time, you know, with the drone, obviously, uh, that, that's huge and uh, really where we see some of the potential and some of this actually in action. So, Fritz, if you wouldn't mind just kind of walking everybody through kind of quickly how that CONOPS works there with the drone as a first responder and, and what that means specifically. Yeah, well, I'll just describe what it looks like uh, on a day to day basis. So they have a pilot that's in a real time crime center in their police department. Uh, you know, he's looking at a big screen TV, can't see the world outside. They have a couple of pilots on two different rooftops, each with a three mile radius flight range. Uh, the two rooftops um, and that three mile radius covers about half the city, uh, about 70% of the calls for service. Um, they're working on expanding to four sites total, which would cover, basically cover their whole city, 52 square miles. 
but uh, the, the, the person in the real-time crime center is just monitoring incoming radio calls, calls on live 911, monitoring the CAD. And when they see that there's an interesting call or a call with potential where, uh, you know, oversight would, you know, an air support would be of assistance, they basically launch the drone and fly the drone to that location and get overhead. So you got, you know, fighting transients or a fire or a robbery now or a domestic violence. And so they're flying 12, 15, 18 missions a day, um, almost always getting ahead of the ground units because the response time is about a minute or two, depending on how far away from the launch site it is. And then that person who's on the, on the controls is also a, a police officer, an experienced incident manager. So they're getting on the radio like another resource and telling officers, yeah, this is what I see and this is how you should approach. And this is which direction the fire is burning and these are the structures that might be in danger. And this is the direction the suspect's leaving and the description of the car and the license plate. And oftentimes, actually 20% of the time, they'll get overhead and realize that the call is old. It does, it's no longer happening. And they can get on the air or call the reporting party and say, hey, we're overhead in a drone. And, and they do it all the time. You'll see the person on the camera waving up at the drone and saying, yeah, those people, that fight is left or the problem's resolved. And so then the drone responds back to base and they clear the unit. So then two units don't have to respond to that. So it's a great resource to not only address critical incidents and maybe give life-saving information to officers before they get there, but it's also a, a resource management tool. And, and the, the on visual line of sight, I mean, without that, you could maybe cover a mile radius, which is about three square miles with beyond visual line of sight flying up to three miles where you can't actually see the drone, but the pilot on the roof can see the airspace and avoid think, avoid aircraft if necessary. That increases the area of coverage by 10, which as you can see, uh, makes it much more scalable. You're just gonna get a lot more incidents that you're able to respond to and add value. Otherwise you'd have to have too many people on too many roofs to, to really provide value to the ground units. Yeah, that, yeah that, that's a great point. The, that, that's the whole thing, right? Being able to fly beyond uh, visual line of sight. And so um, let me share this screen here with you. I'm not sure. This. So here's the dashboard uh, that uh, we were talking about here. So uh, th these numbers to me are absolutely compelling, right? For it's like, I, don't, I remember like when this first came up and watching these numbers on a daily basis, uh, it's incredible to me. So, so they're almost at 3,000 calls responded to. Um, uh, the drone has assisted in some way in uh, 387 arrests. The one, and I don't know, Fritz, I don't know which one of these stats is most compelling to you. The one, and uh, you know, as uh, you know, I'm not, my background's not law enforcement, but the one that really jumps, jumps out at me is almost 700 times the drone deployment avoided dispatching a patrol unit. I mean, to me, that that's that's huge. But uh, I don't know which one of those uh, is uh, kind of the, the biggest one to you. Um, I, I like looking at how many they're going to go over 3000 this week. I was just talking with Vern about it. And so that's I remember when a thousand was a milestone. So now you got yeah. 3000. And so that's that's just an enormous amount of missions. And there are literally hundreds and hundreds of cool incidents um, that are happening every day that um, uh, that, you know, where it adds value. Everyone asked me, um, I, I knew this was coming up. So everyone asked me what, what kind of things does the drone do? So I pulled up three things that happened yesterday uh, on, on uh, with the drone as first responder, if you want to go over those. So, yeah, yeah. Okay. So this is just yesterday. There was like, I think 15 or 20 flights yesterday. So they had a guy on the phone who wanted to commit suicide. There weren't any units available. They, uh, it was on a pay phone. Uh, I'm surprised they find those anymore. And so dispatch uh, was able to watch the video feed because the drone was overhead and they could see uh, he, you know, he wasn't going to hurt himself or anyone else in terms of having weapons. And the dispatchers were talking to the guy on the phone saying, yeah, I can see you. And they described him and, and said, Hey, we're going to have help. Please don't do anything. And, and it became a mental health call, but, but the ability for dispatch to be able to see the people that they're talking to is huge. The next one was uh, it, uh, came out as a, a disturbance road rage. Um, the person uh, was in a fight with someone who was following him. She had a young child in the car. The drone got overhead, found the car, uh, followed the car to an area where the officers were nearby. The drone directed the officers into where the cars were stopped, um, was able to get the license plates of the suspect vehicle, and the officers made contact with them. And then finally, there was an attempt robbery 
Um, they call, heard the call on live 911 before units were available. Uh, the, the drone got overhead and uh, the call came out of the fight in the park with one person being jumped. The drone got overhead, found the suspects uh, who were armed with a gun and brass knuckles. And he followed the uh, suspects as they're leaving the scene was overhead before the officers even realized the call was coming because it wasn't even in CAD yet and uh, and follow and guided the officers into the su to the suspect vehicle to make a stop and that's a rest that wouldn't have happened without the drone so you can imagine as a as a cop getting a radio call of a robbery and then being able to pull out your phone and be able to see immediately the car that is involved and and be directed in by an incident manager on you know making the stop and then having overwatch during the stop in case there's rabbits or, or an incident and that's in a, in a day that happens pretty much every day that that uh, yeah that, to me again it's you know the, the word that i just say over and over again with this is just that's absolutely compelling uh and you think about you know the officers and the community and and just kind of the safety that that data provides um and uh, fascinating stories I'd, I'd heard a few there's one out there we'll see maybe if we can find a link for it um and send it to everybody but it's the one with the motorcycle and yeah the, you know the motorcycle the first, chase yeah that was really the first aha one where you know because at first we were operating within a mile so we were kind of a, a slave to the limited work within a mile of the station and everyone was wondering is going to be worth the effort and then that one which there's a video out there was a really uh you know where everybody got excited hey this is this has a lot of potential i won't go over that story because i think it's well told i think the one that's most compelling was the the one where the guy was out in front playing with a toy gun in front of a, a taco shop and it kind of reminded us of the tamir rice incident and how you could really change the dynamic of being able to see and hear what's going on before getting there yeah yeah i remember i remember you actually talking about that before this whole thing got you know when you were still in kind of the con ops part of it uh talking about that and 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 having that data you know when you're coming up on scene and i did see that video too and it's um yeah it's 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 pretty amazing um can you talk so i guess one of the things that we talk about bb loss uh that that we kind of missed out on is a scene where you have an officer who comes up on a scene and for whatever reason like maybe, you know, maybe the DFR drones are not able, maybe they're not working, but that officer maybe has a drone that they can use. Um, can you talk a little bit about the the close proximity, uh, low altitude stuff that you've been working on? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I think most people who have a drone program understand this challenge. I, it's, it exists for everybody flying a drone is how would you keep the drone, your eyes on the drone the whole time when it flies behind a house or behind trees and it's, it's not so far away you can't see it like a DFR operation, but it is uh, not in your view the whole time. And everybody's kind of been struggling of putting the drone where you need it to be, but also complying with that FAA regulation. And one of the concerns was how do you mitigate ground risk? How do you make sure you don't hit things? And, you know, when I came with Skydio over with Skydio and saw the, its ability to, to see the world around it, it kind of sparked an idea that, um, you know, perhaps this drone is enough of a mitigation to be able to get a waiver that says, if you promise not to fly so high, you're in national airspace and get hit by manned aircraft. So you promise to stay low to the ground below the infrastructure and use infrastructure infrastructure masking. And then you have some ground-based risk mitigation like obstacle avoidance. Would the FAA allow you to fly beyond visual line of sight then? And then, of course, I reached out to Charles Warner Drone Responders, and he pointed me to Chris Sadler over at York, who had d done a lot of work on, on a waiver just like that, um, it requiring some effort, right, and some time to set up. And so I wanted an, a solution that could be deployed and used in the first minutes of an incident or emergency. And so started working on that at Skydio, got their team involved, got Chula Vista involved. Um, Brennan Groves came on board and done some work in this area. So it was really a team effort. Um, and then Chula Vista wrote, you know, we wrote the waiver and Chula Vista submitted it and just recently received approval to fly beyond visual line of sight um, under the parameters, uh, as long as they didn't go higher than 50 feet above the uh, highest infrastructure around them and no long, no further than 1500 feet from the pilot, they could fly beyond visual line of sight. The FAA calls that tactical beyond visual line of sight. 
Um, internally, we've been calling it uh, close proximity, low altitude, uh, because that's the type of flight that we wanted to do. And so I think it's resonating. I'm hearing a lot from agencies who want to get waivers, similar waivers. We're, we'd love to see the FAA make that easier and easier for agencies. Um, and and I, I think it is a solution that's going to open up a lot of doors and really increase the value of drones on these tactical operations. Yeah, that's so, have you guys been, have you deployed that yet? Or, or has Chula Vista deployed that yet? Or do you know, or can you talk about yeah, that? Yeah, Chula Vista has the waiver. And okay. so they have the ability to fly beyond visual line of sight um, under those parameters. So they have a, a, the TVVLOS, as the FAA calls it, CPLA, as well yeah. as the DFR related beyond visual line of sight. So they actually have two different beyond visual line of sight waivers um, and both are very unique. In fact, the CPLA, as it's written, as Chula Vista is operating on it, is, I believe, is speaking with Brendan Groves, it's the first beyond the visual line of sight waiver that doesn't require the use of a VO or some other type of ground-based surveillance system to mitigate the risk. So it really is groundbreaking. I think it's gonna open up a lot of potential going forward. Um, you know, drones, I think, are becoming easier to fly. I mean, Skydio with their autonomy engine is yeah. really, trying to take the, the worry out of it and make it much more scalable for many more police and fire departments, public safety, where anybody needs to fly a drone. Um, and so I, it's just another step forward from, you know, the years ago that you and I were talking about this DFR one. Uh, it's, it's crazy. It's, it's, it's great to see. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, it's, it's absolutely incredible to see where, where it's at now and um, definitely thank you for all of your work along those lines because it makes it easier, I think, for the rest of us. Um, one of the things that, that comes up and one of the questions I get a lot with this kind of stuff too is flight over people and are you allowed to do that and um, do you have any mitigations for that? Um, I know on the part 107 side, you pretty much need a parachute. Uh, it's a little bit different, I think, on the COA side. But uh, but what do you think about that as far as flight over people and, and how that works? Well, to be honest, there, it's it's pretty unclear, actually. Yeah. Um, it's not very well defined. It's, it's kind of like, you know, you know it when you see it. Um, there are a lot of agencies that are flying under 107 only and then flying in and air over, over areas that you might think have people, but they're doing... Uh, doing it in a way that they're staying over buildings. Right, like they're, off to the side, yeah. Off to the yeah. side, they're, 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 they're doing things to be able to have ground, ground awareness. And so there is a way to be operational 107 and still fly over the community. Um, having said that, I think that one of the advantages of having a COA, and most agencies probably should have operate under both, uh, both the COA and 107, but having the COA, uh, allows you to be able to fly over people in cases of emergency. And, you know, in police work and fire, a lot of what we're doing, you know, what they're doing is emergency related. So you, you have that ability to fly over people, still obviously taking um, care not to fly over static crowds or, or, or large groups of people. But um, Chula Vista obviously is out flying over the community every day. Um, and, uh, they're doing that because they have a COA and the FAA understands that the increased ground risk, the assumption of, of liability is on the city. That's one of the reasons that they allow you to self-certify your pilot, self-certify your aircraft as a public aircraft operator. So um, it's a little bit of a nuance and, and it's, it, there is no, you talk to three or four different FAA guy, um, reps and you might get slightly different answers, but I think as long as you take care and do what you can to mitigate the risk to people on the ground, you're going to be able to do the missions you want to do, at least from a public safety standpoint. Yeah, I, well said. Thank you for kind of that, that explanation from somebody who's, who's been through that process and has dealt with flying over people every day. And the thing, because you're right, you're not going to find that anywhere written down, right? We get this question a lot from uh, uh, especially public safety agencies that are trying to really kind of follow the letter of the law, but you're right. It's not totally clear uh, about that flight over people. And I, and I have, I'm with you. I've talked to four different FAA people and I've kind of gotten four different answers 
uh, as far as, you know, kind of what that means. I've heard people use the term incidental flight over people. And you're right. I think it's that simple. As long as you're not uh, loitering over people, um, you know, you're, the drone is transiting somewhere. Um, I even think they told us that in those IPV. IPP meetings that that would be acceptable right. to them, although it's difficult to find that in writing anywhere. So, um, but I did want to touch on that just for a minute. So, uh, thank you for that. Um, so, we're, I think we're about forty-five minutes here. Um, Shauna, do we have any questions? Or I, mean, I guess I'll just take a minute here and um, kind of open it up and see if uh, there's anything anyone else wanted to talk about or us to kind of come back to. Sure. I, just so everyone knows, I put the link to the to the Vista site that uh, Ben put up there in the chat box, and I just put his information up there, uh, his contact information up there as well. Um, so I uh, so I have a question, but I'll see if there's anyone else uh, on on the line that um, wants to, to chime in um, by unmuting themselves or in the chat box. Okay. So uh, I have a question for either, and I guess it's kind of a two part. So maybe the first to Fritz is, is, you know, you mentioned the ideal process would be to get the team in place first and then look at the appropriate system. Um, how did you roll that out at, at Chula Vista? Did you, did you have community meetings kind of towards the beginning and just say, look here, even as you're looking into that um, type of uh, UAS system and program and kind of get their input. And then the other part to, to Ben is, do you, have you talked to agencies who maybe have even invited you to come participate if they're going to use your your services or your product and just kind of so that the, the public has an absolute understanding of what the what the device can do what its privacy protections are all those types of things um, what kind of community engagement aspects at the beginning of this rollout have you witnessed so at tool vista they did they had uh, meetings um, like i said they got stakeholders within the departments the city attorney um, and some leaders within the community had some meetings, established the policy. Once they had a policy, they presented it to city council and there was an opportunity for public to come in and make comments then. Um, once, uh, the, and that was enough to start the program and buy the first few platforms. Um, and they, like, they started small, they bought a couple, they just did it on uh, limited use cases for you know, short search and rescue or some major operations where they want overwatch. Um, and then once DFR started rolling, then we had more meetings. Uh, we presented in front of council again, and we actually had a specific um, community meeting set up inviting people to specifically talk about uh, drone as first responder and the use of drones in the community. And then obviously we did a lot of social media and talking to local media, um, made sure that you, it'd be hard to live in Chula Vista and not be aware that they had a drone program going on. Yeah, I, uh, I, I, I kind of second that. And what I would say on that is like we've, so I've been to, um, you know, I think we, we've worked with agencies in, in 30 some states and done training in 20 some states. And um, the, where I've seen agencies be successful is having that community engagement piece. And, and really the successful ones are like what Chula Vista did. Uh, one of the first trainings that, that I ever did actually was uh, with an agency in Indiana. And I showed up and they were like, hey, the media is going to be here for the entire training day. And I was like, awesome, great. And it's the same kind of thing. And in that community, everyone knows there's a drone program there and everyone knows uh, what it's for and, and, um, and the success that they've had with it. So that kind of continued transparency and continued engagement, I think, is important too. So there was a question in the chat box. Um, what did or what is CVPD uh, using to live stream their drone footage to dispatch officers to uh, the command post? Yeah, so uh, we started a partnership for the IPP with CAPE, which has since been acquired by Motorola and Motorola Aerial. So they renamed it, but essentially what it is, it's a teleoperation. So it's more than streaming. The teleoperation allows you to fly the drone remotely. So, so although you have a pilot in command on the roof that has a remote control in their hand, they're flying it through this Motorola Aerial software which allows someone else anywhere in the world on a computer to be able to fly the drone remotely. Um, uh, and that is the, that Motorola aerial is then streamed out to their spectator app. So anyone with that app can log in and see exactly what the uh, DFR pilot in the real time crime center can see as well as pull it up on a computer. The dispatchers will have it up on their computers. So they'll, They'll have a little box in the corner that shows the, the live drone feed at all times. And, and one of the things, just to add to that, one of the things that 
uh, was a part of a part of you know this getting approved through the FAA was the ability to geofence with that software, right? And be able to kind of map out like regardless of what the operator inputs, the drone can't go beyond this point, it can't go higher than this altitude or past this building or beyond the boundaries of whatever can be set. And that can be done like really simply with uh, with the software. Right. And that was important. That mitigation was important because technically speaking, the person on the roof has ultimate control. They're the pilot in the command. They can, as soon as they touch the joysticks, the person downstairs is kicked off. Um, that satisfies the need, but the FAA requirement that the pilot in command be in full control of the drone at all times. And so essentially just a, allowing the person downstairs permission through electronic approval to fly the drone as long as they obey the, the predetermined parameters set up by the geofence and also the pilot in command's um, overall sense of airspace. Any final questions for either gentleman? Well, hearing none, Ben and Fritz, thank you guys for your time and for the for the insights. And again, uh, all the, the links and information was provided in the chat box, but if you have any other questions or need to get a hold of by the gentleman, we can hear for you. If we had CPO, we can certainly uh, help you do that. So we, we appreciate your time and, and the information that you shared. And thanks everyone uh, for joining and have a great uh, rest of the day and, and great weekend coming up. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Sean. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you, Ben.